Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be with you all today, and I really look forward to discussing today how space plays a role, not just in our lives, uh, but in lives around the world. I partly want to share my personal journey uh, with coming to discover how I could have a career in space while also having a career that helped me know that I was making a difference for the next generation of lives of young girls uh, in the US, but also in every country in the world. So first I'll ask you to kind of join me on a journey, and we're gonna think about uh, the United Nations. <laughs> in the 1960s, the world was discovering that we were going to be able to operate in outer space, and we were gathering together as countries. You have a scene here from kind of the modern day setting where the Office of Outer Space Affairs and the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space come together to deliberate on international space policy. And in the 60s, they were developing our first outer space treaty, the uh, way we would think about how we would work together in space as an international community. And some of the early words they talked about in those treaties expressed that we wanted space to be useful really to all humankind, and that it shouldn't matter the level of socioeconomic development of a country, but that every country should be benefiting. So I'm reflecting today on how our progress report in that area. My short answer is that, yes, I think we really are benefiting all humankind, but there's work that all of us can do to continue to improve that. And that's been part of my personal journey as well. So I'll ask you to imagine with me that we're standing in a humid evening. It's around midnight. We're in central Florida on the coast, and three teenagers who have been spending all day working in an office are standing outside next to a very large building called the Vehicle Assembly Building. We're at Cape Canaveral, about to wait for our launch. It's the third night in a row we're out late because uh, it's the third time they've tried to launch the space shuttle. It's the Discovery mission, and Eileen Collins is the first woman commander of a mission. We're trying to launch the X-ray telescope called Chandra, and I'm standing there as a 17-year-old, just thinking about my future career and about having spent a summer watching large facilities for the space station being prepared to launch to space. And finally, uh, we start counting down, and soon uh, we find out it's going to be the first success after these three nights of failure. And I'm so excited to watch the lights come on as the shuttle goes off, and suddenly it seems as if it's daytime, even though it's midnight. And for about five seconds, the sky is totally bright, and suddenly you feel the rumble of the space shuttle. And that's basically why I'm here. <laughs> it's the day that I decided I wanted to study space engineering, and that I wanted to be part of NASA's mission. And I was really eager to find a university that I could do that, and I went and decided to study at MIT. And I was eager to be part of teams that would put these space telescopes into space and to bring back data that help us understand the universe. And that seemed all very simple, right? It was kind of a clear path for my career. So that was summer of 99. But I will highlight that the next summer, I had another question, and I had uh, other ideas I also wanted to explore. I actually spent the following summer, after my freshman year at MIT, uh, in Kenya, partly in Nairobi and partly in a rural area, uh, serving at a school for girls from slums like this. This is Kibera slum, which is one of the largest in Nairobi. In addition to being inspired by wanting to be part of important space missions, I also had a question about other people, maybe young girls like me who did not have the same opportunities. Like here I was being able to choose an amazing opportunity to study at a school, to really choose any career path I wanted. And I was becoming more and more aware of people around the world that don't have the same access to opportunity that I had. I asked myself, what can I do that makes a difference in their lives or in their communities? And does space have anything to do with that? For a while I kind of assumed, well, I'll have my space career on one hand and I'll have maybe volunteer work on the other hand, and I thought they would be totally separate activities. And so here I was studying at MIT, this is a picture of our unified classroom, which is our sophomore engineering class, the, one of the most challenging things we do as engineers, just full of theories and proofs and long equations, and I was pretty sure what I was learning had little to do with the girls I'd spent time with in Kenya. But eventually, actually, thanks to the NASA Academy, uh, I had a chance to learn something important, which is that not only in Kenya do we have people struggling with poverty, we also have scientists and experts who actually do understand how to use our resources from space to make a difference in development. This is a picture of a, an organization in Kenya called the Regional Center for the Mapping of Resources for Devel Development. And they are part of a network of organizations around the world that use data from satellites operated by NASA, by Europe, by many international partners. And they are very knowledgeable about how to take that data and solve important challenges for development and planning in their country. And when I started to see that, and then later I learned about a NASA program that's collaborating closely with them to make sure that they have the best training, the best data access possible, I realized that I could stay in the space industry and continue to serve humankind, continue to serve governments, deciding how to use technology for the development questions, continue to invite uh, girls like me around the world to be part of decision making about how to uh, bring our own development into play. And that's why I'm still here in the space community now and I didn't sort of have to leave and go off into a development job. I'm really doing both at the same time. So I continued my, my graduate studies at MIT. I had a chance to work on the Spheres project you might be aware of. It's these uh, robots we have on ISS that are able to help us do technology development. And as I explored graduate school, 
Again, I felt, felt kind of stuck, even though I knew that out there somewhere there were people using NASA data for development, I wasn't quite sure what I should personally do in my own contributions. So I was inspired by neat projects like Spheres, but I also had a question as to what I could do in my own special team. Meanwhile, I just want to highlight, uh, for anyone who's thought about going to grad school, uh, I want to just encourage you to persevere. I throw this picture in here just to highlight that as I was going through this process of exploring my own interests and trying to get through challenging classes and research projects, um, there were times when I was really discouraged. This is a picture of our MIT medical clinic. While I was a grad school student at MIT, I found it was really helpful to get help sometimes. There were times I was depressed and times I needed to be really encouraged by somebody just outside my immediate field. So it's just a reminder that uh, we can all be successful and can find really challenging opportunities, but it's no shame if you have to sometimes ask for help and say, this is overwhelming right now. So I want to share that as a, just a special commercial for everyone. <laughs> Eventually, what helped me get actually less depressed was partly figuring out how I could really do what I most cared about while staying in my space field. And it led me to an opportunity to do research about how countries around the world are adopting space technology and using it to address their own development needs, both in terms of technology development and also in terms of using the space technology to answer important questions. I was able to do fundraising, and here it's both good for starting companies and for funding research. Uh, so I got funding from NASA, from Department of Defense, and also from private foundations to study this question of how space technology is being used around the world. And so I traveled in South Africa, uh, as well as in Nigeria, visiting their National Space Agency. I visited countries like Kenya, again, to, this time not just to volunteer, but to think about their government policies towards space technology. Uh, I visited the UAE, which, as you may know, uh, is, is really ambitious now in their space activity, but early on they focused a lot on training engineers who could become uh, effective satellite engineers and really think about how to use satellite data for their own development. I also visited places in Southeast Asia, including Malaysia and Thailand, Singapore and Vietnam. And during all this travel, I was doing research, and in a sense, social science research, asking the question, how do governments decide how to use technology best and how to do the development of a new generation of space engineers? And what are the opportunities we have to make this even better in the future? So I've become a part of this network of leaders and really had the privilege to listen to leaders who are the first founding space leaders in their countries. And we now have opportunities to share the knowledge from these, these first experiences so that other countries can also follow on their path. I'll just highlight too, I'm very thankful for my current work over the last couple of years, having finished my graduate studies, having gotten experience in industry and in several organizations. I've now brought that work to NASA and I've had the opportunity both to serve at NASA headquarters and now at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And NASA gives me another chance to kind of have this view even further expanded. And I'm lucky for the opportunity both to think about what we can do from satellites, but also from planes. And of course, I've been talking about how we use space technology to address human needs. And I went to a place where there are no humans, but I found a connection even there. So I had a chance to fly on a NASA flight uh, going over Antarctica. And to see Antarctica with my own eyes was really a privilege. And to recognize it's not just a place on a map, but, but a real solid place that we can touch and, and feel. I was actually on a plane over it, but uh, to be able to understand how real and important and fragile it is. Even that, to me, actually asks, how does this, in fact, affect all humankind? Because it is really the heritage of all humankind. So as we do our science at NASA and as we think about uh, the opportunities, we're continually asking the question, uh, how does this serve not just those who are already uh, established and developed, but those who are our, our next generation of development? You may know that NASA has about 20 uh, platforms, including ISS, our space station, that allow us to do uh, NASA Earth science and develop uh, an understanding of what's going on in our whole Earth system. And so, uh, of course, I think all of you know that you have access to this information. It's shared freely, uh, and we want you to be a part of understanding how we use it. Here's just one example showing a video. It's really compiling a lot of kinds of data, but it's showing uh, really our, our biosphere, our living things, including um, both on land and in the sea, where our chlorophyll-based life forms are. Another example here is looking at uh, several satellites to help us understand uh, rainfall and estimate where it happens all over the world. And of course, this is just the beginning of the story. If you need to use this kind of data to address a question, we need to take this kind of information and then apply it in a decision support system. That's really what I'm focused on these days, is asking how can we take the excellent science results that we have and apply it in a way that helps someone decide when to plant a crop or how to uh, plan a long-term food security program for a country or how to organize um, kind of networks of groups that work together to address disaster response. Another example here, we can even think about how to address disease because when we think about rainfall, some diseases are spread by mosquitoes and their activities affected by the rain and the other kinds of environmental factors. So if you take a look at the red spots on this shot, you'll see that there's some areas where there was really uh, more or less than expected uh, rain and then follow especially the, the blue areas and follow those with your eyes 
You'll see the same areas later uh, were also places where we saw unexpected or uh, worse than expected uh, disease outbreaks. So we're busy at NASA thinking about what our next generation of tools will be in partnership mainly with people outside. That's actually an exciting part of, of these days. NASA really does the science, and we actually look for people like you to ask how that science is taken out into the next cycle to make sure we are serving people around the world. One more example just looks at um, air quality. So this map is mapping areas in red, especially high uh, pollutants, uh, including particulate matter, uh, ozone, nitrous oxide, all things that are results of human activity. So watch the spots in red, especially in the US. This is 2005 data. If you go to 2011 data, you see a market change. And here's one way of talking about the benefits of regulations toward air quality that we can actually measure from space. And again, all these are long-term effects and approaches that we use to understand how we're using satellite technology to make a difference in people's lives and to inform decisions we have to make about the future. So when reflecting on this question of is space for the benefit of all humankind, I can say in many ways the answer is yes. In many ways we are using the technology in very applied ways that makes a direct difference in people's lives. But there's plenty more work to do, and I invite you guys to join me. If you're interested in a career that really blends uh, the work we do in space with the excitement of developing new engineering approaches, new ways to put satellites in space, new ways to get data, new ways to make data applied, but also thinks directly about the societal impact, also listens carefully to people in communities around the world and asks, what is it that you'd like to do with this technology? Join me, we can think about this question. There's plenty of great work to be done, so thank you. Mm -hmm.